So everyone, thanks for coming to our, our virtual Haskell meetup. Uh, we have a super great talk lined up this afternoon. Although it's actually nighttime, I think, for our speaker, Anthony, who is in London. Our host for this meetup is No Red Inc. We were originally planning to have this meetup in their office, but obviously that didn't work out. So thanks everyone for joining us online. Katie from No Red Inc. is here to tell you a little bit about No Red Inc., uh, which is one of the companies in San Francisco that uses Haskell. Uh, but before I hand it off to her, a uh, few logistical details. First, we ask that everyone mute their microphones unless you are speaking uh, to avoid extra background noise. Also, I wanted to give a quick shout out to the Scala meetup group, since they kindly announced this meetup in their group. They're having a meetup on Thursday uh, in the Reactive Systems meetup group. Uh, you can find a link to that in the description for this meetup. Another thing, uh, this meetup is being recorded, so be on your best behavior. We will post this to our YouTube channel, barring technical difficulties during the recording. Uh, also, um, during the talk, feel free to use Zoom uh, chat to ask questions for our speaker, Anthony, or for our host, Katie, or for us, the organizers. Finally, just a quick word about the Haskell Meetup group. Ryan is here with us. He's also one of the organizers. The other organizer is Nick, who I think might not have been able to join us today. Uh, we run this group as volunteers, and there are two ways to help us out if you want. First, if you want to give a talk at a future meetup, please feel free to reach out to us uh, by messaging us on meetup.com. And second, uh, when the time comes for us to resume working in our offices, if there is a possibility that you could physically host a future meetup, please do let us know. Hosting is pretty easy. Typically, uh, we just need a big room with a projector and uh, refreshments for our guests if possible. So if you're interested in giving a talk or hosting a future meetup, please let us know. Okay, so I think we're ready to get started now. First, I'll hand it off to Katie to introduce No Red Ink. So Katie, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Stefan. So uh, I'm Katie, and I'm a software engineer at No Red Inc. No Red Inc. is an educational technology company that writes software for English teachers. So it started off primarily as generative grammar questions like, uh, those balls over, over there are theirs. What there were, was used in that sentence? And generating questions for kids to practice their grammar. Now it is more inclusive of writing as a whole. We also have like uh, essays that kids can write and then we guide them through doing a self review of their own essay before they turn that into the teacher. And so No Red Inc. is very involved with the Elm community. If you're unfamiliar with Elm, it is a front end language that compiles to JavaScript. And we have a number of the core members that uh, from Elm that work at No Red Inc., including the creator of the language. Uh, it's a fun and functional language, and its compiler and as well as other meta tools are written that are written for it are written in Haskell. And so No Red Ink is was originally a Ruby Haml JavaScript house, but as things got converted to Elm, we wanted stuff, we wanted type safety all along the stack. So here comes Haskell. Uh, we've been rolling out usage of Haskell when teams have small projects that could be standalone services. And this serves as our Haskell onboarding for each team to get everyone trained in writing Haskell. We have a whole team dedicated to helping uh, with the Haskell transition, and they help to teach people and also build out any helpful tooling ahead of time. One thing that that team has learned is that it's not enough to only build a project in Haskell when it's convenient or a good fit. If you do that, you're never going to write anything in Haskell. You have to dive in and invest in the time in order, even if there aren't any short-term gain or any obvious short-term gains. Uh, as far as our development setup goes, if you're interested, our builds are done through Nix and Shake. We use Ormalu as our formatter, but we're interested in writing our own. And then on the front end, we generate Elm clients from the Haskell backend, and then that gives us guaranteed consistent types between the two. We also get type safety down the database level by using Postgres QL typed. Um, other fun things are that we have a Haskell book. We have had two Haskell book clubs since I have joined. I've been primarily involved with that as opposed to actually writing Haskell at work just because my team so far has been mostly Ruby and Elixir. And then 
we also have a group of people working on an Elm flavor of Haskell. So library, we've been porting over the Elm core library over to Haskell to lo uh, lower the learning curve and help Elm developers jump over to Haskell. It's called cherry because it's both a tree like Elm and a flavor like of Haskell. There's no release date yet for that, but be excited. And I really hope that as we progress using Haskell at No Red Ink, you'll see us more in the greater Haskell community. I'm really glad we were able to connect and host today. So thank you all for tuning in. And now I'll throw it over to Anthony to get us started with a ghost story. Thank you, thank you, Katie. Uh, yes, I'm here today to talk about a paper that I recently read uh, by Matt Noonan called Ghosts of Departed Proofs. And sort of the question that this, this, this paper tries to pose is, what if I told you, you could achieve many of the benefits of dependent and refinement types, of dependent and refinement types, whilst only require, requiring some minor and well understood ex, ha, ex, uh, extensions to Haskell 2010? Uh, that's sort of the, the, sort of the, the, the question that it tries to answer. Um, but before we dive into the, the what, the, what a perfect API might be. I think it's useful to explore what are the unsafe API patterns. So first I'd like to talk about unsafe API patterns and I'd like to introduce the head API. This is, this is us using an API, it's called, the function is head. It takes a list of elements and then returns the first element. And we can see it being used correctly here, but in the case that we were to pass it an empty list, then we end up with an exception. And th this means a couple of things. It, it very likely me means that for the user of the application, if they're lucky, they see a stack trace and a message saying, please send this to the developers. Um, but fortunately, it does mean that the, the error can be fairly self-contained, uh, as opposed to the other kind of um, unsafe API pattern, uh, which, which is, in, is instead of exploding, you'd get sort of a, an error result. Um, and you, you, you see sort of similar things to this in uh, sort of older APIs. And um, usually this is, this, this can also mean that for other parts of the program, which then would use the result of this function, they can then end up with, you can, you can end up with the, the errors, you can, you can end up with invalid values sort of infecting the state of your whole program. And it can be actually, this variant can be more uh, difficult to debug uh, than the first. So how can we do better? I'm gonna talk about two approaches um, with the head function. Um, one that's going to expand the possible outputs, and then, uh, and by out by outputs I mean the a return value, and then we're going to look about look at restricting the inputs of this function. So, this is the venerable maybe type, which says to the user, "Hey friend, this function might fail. You'll need to handle the nothing case." And this is often one of the first examples that's used when introducing people to the, the wonderful tenets of strongly typed programming. And it's very much, it's very much a one size fits all. You just have your, have your function that previously was, was panicking and you then can just slap on a maybe or an either. Um, and then everything is gonna be great. The library author can just sleep, rests at night, uh, content in the knowledge that their function will never cause a runtime error. Do we think this is true? What about the users of the library? They're often asked to handle error cases when they've correctly ensured a precondition is met. And it's no wonder that so many well-meaning users will just reach for from just as they feel rightly justified that they can just ignore the error case entirely. But who can say what will happen over time? Who can say that this, the user's mental proof um, 
will continue to remain, remain valid. And the software, in this case, has been left in the brittle state. And all that has happened here is responsibility for failure has been pushed forward to the, user, to the users, which, which is an improvement over panicking because at least the users know that the function could fail. Um, but let's, let's try a different approach. So instead of, um, instead of changing the return type, what we could do is change the input type of our um, head function such that for every possible input, we know that we can give an output. So we, we can then introduce the non-empty list type. Um, and for the safe, now the safe head function is saying, you must provide me with a non-empty list. I refuse to work with any other list because then I might fail and that would be annoying. And this is where you start getting into the territory of sort of refinement and quotient types. And there's lots of pros and cons to these different approaches. Um, in this case, you often have to re-implement parts of the standard library for all of your, your um, different, for all your different data structures, for example, re-implementing length. Um, and then this, this approach can also be awkward when you're, uh, when you're encoding preconditions that relate to multiple inputs. For example, if you have a requirement for say the zip function that two lists have the same length. And this, this brings me on to something that I, I'm just gonna uh, slip into this talk, which I think is, is somewhat related. And I think this is a, a really wonderful photo. If you read the caption, it says, at the San Francisco Museum of Art, an abstract gets close scrutiny. Um, and I'd like, I'd like to talk about responsi responsibility in code. So when code hands us responsibility, we have two choices. Um, we can either handle it or pass it on. So for example, if a function returns a maybe, then it's very likely that I'll also return a maybe too. Um, and this, this is kind of handled by maybe the, the, the maybe or either monad, monad, but you can often end up with the maybe or either monad sort of growing. It can sort of end up encompassing a lot of your program when really you just want to have a map lookup in one place. Um, so yeah, people will pass responsibility in the same direction the code they called us. Um, and the second thing that I'd like to talk about in responsibility um, is that when we restrict what we can do in our function types, it's easier to understand what we can do. So for example, if we restrict our types sufficiently enough, then there can be only one implementation possible, for example, the, the identity function. But then if we look at some, some sort of counterexamples, if you look at the take function, I don't know what the expected behavior is if I were to pass a negative number as the first input. Maybe it returns an empty list, maybe it starts taking from the end of the list. Um, and then the, uh, with the length function, if obviously with the length, length function, I have an intuition of how it works. But if this was a, a, a different, more complex function, then what would, what would it mean for this function to return a negative number? So, so then you'd probably want to have a positive integer, integer type as the return type. So the more precisely our types describe our program, the fewer ways we have to go wrong. Um, cool. So back, back to the paper. So this is, I'm gonna share with you a case, a case study of uh, where we, we want to sort two lists uh, and then efficiently merge them to produce a third sorted list. Um, so you can see this in this example, our unsafe merge, merge by function will first take a comparator uh, and then the first and then the second list and then we'll return a merge list. So you can see a little bit further down, we will first sort uh, two lists and then we can call unsafe merge by with the same comparator, we get the correct result. Um, but if we were to pass a different comparator, then, then you can see that we get, we get clearly a wrong result. Um, and you, you can imagine that 
for, for unsafe merge by, if you know that the two lists are already sorted with the same comparator, you can come up with a, a fairly efficient implementation. So how can we make this a bit safer? Let's think back to our, our, our practices that we just, we just looked at. Let's, let's try the maybe approach. Let's try uh, putting maybe, uh, adding a maybe to the, the return type. Okay, this, this looks a little bit better, but, but, uh, but wait. For the, uh, for the library author, okay, they, they now have to check if the two lists passed are sorted. Uh, okay, then they, then, they can, um, then they can return, uh, the, then they can actually run the function if, if the two lists are already sorted, but this, this does have a bit of a, uh, a performance impact. So for them, they have, they've added these checks that have added more complexity. Um, the user has worse performance, and then the user also needs to pattern match on the result, which for them, they may, they may feel they already know the outcome of the match, so they will then again will just reach for from just. So it's no wonder that the status quo is to display a stern warning in the docs that admonishes any user who tries to merge by what they didn't sort by. And if you look in the wild, Hackage finds 2,000 cases of lookup followed by from just. And lookup is just trying to be good, but the user has a reason to believe the key is in the map. And, it, and they just couldn't tell the API, hey, here's my proof. So can we do better? Because what we, what we really want is we want more of a dialogue between the library and the user, where the library author can state in their, um, in their functions. Hey, this function can only be used when X holds. And then the user can come along and say, I have ensured X holds, please let me use this without returning a maybe. Uh, and a more, and if I were to phrase, uh, if I were to phrase that, that sort of conversation in a more technical way, you could put it like this. How can we reflect constraints on function input values in the function type. And this is where, this is where dependent types are great. And um, they're, 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 they're truly wonderful, but the Haskell implementation can be sometimes a bit challenging. And as the constraints are very much about the values that um, you're, passing, you're passing to the function, you then need to have a, have a good system of reflecting or uh, having the same values that your function is talking about in the site type system, which cannot be always so easy. So I, I will now introduce you to the first idea of the paper, which it puts quite nicely as, as conjuring up. Uh, and it's just, it's just this, little snippet, this little snippet of code. Um, but let me, let's, let's break this down a little bit um, more closely. So idea number one is having phantom type level names for values. So we, we introduce a new type wrapper equipped with a phantom type parameter name, which is saying a value of type A with name N. And this has no runtime cost. And you can also see here that we introduce a type synonym, um, sort of a slightly nicer syntax that we can use. But if we were to just export the named constructor directly to the user, then they would just be able to create any na a named value of any type. So we need to we need something a little bit smarter. Um, so we need we need a way to introduce names. Um, and if you've come across the st monad. Uh, this, is, this, this, is, this takes a similar approach um, as, as run st. So name, uh, this, this function takes a value, uh, and then a function that operates on that value that does an existential quanti quantification of the name. And it's saying, if I have an a, then there exists some name such that a has that name. And this, this, gives, us, this gives us a way 
to safely for the user to to name values and to to um, yeah to name values. But as we're not exporting the constructor, we do need a way to be able to access the underlying A's, the underlying the underlying values. Um, so we introduced this this class that uh, uses safe coerce and it's how we will forget names and it's also ensuring that forgetting a name incurs no runtime cost and for pretty much all the common cases the default method here is good great so we, we have this little piece of piece of machinery which is named um, but to go back to to go back to our original question how can we reflect constraints on function input values in the function type. I'd like to introduce the second idea um, that the paper introduces, which is predicates as new types with phantom type parameters. So here we introduce a, a, a sorted by predicate, which has a phantom type parameter name, which will be the, uh, which will be the function that was used to sort for A. Um, and you can see here we're, we're giving ourselves an instance to be able to call the, um, the, the, the method to be able to ac just access the A. Um, and then how do we use this predicate? Well, with a few changes um, and with a little bit of wrapping of the existing standard library, we can do something like this. So we can take our sort by function and we can use our infix type synonym um, to name the first argument, which is the ordering function. And we're going to name it this type variable comp. We're then going to, of course, take, take, the, take the list as before. But then we're going to return our new type. Um, we're then going to return our new type. We're going to return sorted by with the, sec with, with the phantom type parameter as the, the, the comparator function that was passed in. So then if we look at the implementation, we can see that we're going to call the, um, we're going to call the the method on our comparator to be able to ac actually access the underlying function. We're then going to call the standard library sort by function. And then we're going to coerce it into, um, into our uh, new type uh, that we our uh, new type predicate, um, and then when it comes to our merge by function, I think something something quite magical happens here. So we we first also also take a comparator function, um, and then we then we have these 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 two inputs, which are two two sorted by um, new type new type wrapped lists. But with the same type variable, um, with the, but requiring the same comp to be passed to be to be for both of them. So we we wouldn't have been able to compare functions directly for equality, but the type signature here ensures that both the lists that are passed in have to be the same. And I yeah I think this is this is this is quite magical. Um, and if we look to the look to the implementation, you can see similarly we will strip the new type wrappers with our the function. Uh, we will call the standard library. Uh, we can, we'll call the prelude merge by um, function, and then we will coerce to a new sorted by uh, new type wrapper. Um, so if we were to if we were to compare the different approaches we've just seen. In the first case, we were getting a nonsense result. Um, in the second case, we ran into problems with, well, the user can see when they first wrote the code that clearly they're passing the same function in, but then six months later, someone comes along and, and maybe rearranges some code. And then six months after that, someone comes along and then changes the function and gets passed in. Uh, and then, 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 then we see a, a runtime error. Um, so let's let's have a look at how we would use what we've created in the previous uh, 
the previous uh, couple of slides and how, how we would use them to ensure that what was passed, that firstly the lists have been sorted with the same comparator uh, and that the comparator that is, that is then passed to merge by uh, is also the same comparator. So this is what it would look like. And let's, let's bring that up uh, slightly bigger. So we were using our name combinator and we're passing compare, which is, which is, which is the, the function that we wish to name, the, the value that we wish to name, which is, which is of course our comparison function. We then have a, a lambda that takes, that has now our named compare function as GT. And then we'll pass GT to our new sort by functions to produce the sorted list. And then when it comes to use, when, when it comes time for us to use merge by, we can then pass GT to. So this, this is, this is a, a fairly simple trick that means that if we were to pass a different function to either of the lists, either of the original sort bys or um, merge by, we would then see a compile time error. And actually a compile time error with a fairly um, comprehensible uh, message. Um, and yes, merge by cannot be called with a different comparator than the sorted lists were created with. Um, the user has a bit more flexibility uh, in how they can, they, they can decide when and how to validate uh, certain API preconditions are met instead of not, instead of being, being forced or having no checks at all. Um, and okay, maybe you, you, you can, you can argue with, you can argue with this, whether this is many of the benefits, but we've, we've only used a, a couple of Haskell extensions. We've, and we've, we've got some quite cool stuff just with a few Haskell extensions. And yeah, just an additional example. So you can see how, where you could, where you could start to take this. If you had a sorted by list, then you would be able to extract the minimal element with respect to a given comparator, just by knowing that you could always take the first um, element. Great. So that's, that's sort of the, the simpler part of the paper and it's sort of like a, an evolution of how we can create safer um, APIs. And then comes the more, the less, the less obvious part of the paper perhaps, um, where we start talking about ghostly proofs. So before we were sticking a name into the phantom type parameter, but we could put anything there. So we could, we could even put some more complicated type that, that would represent the safety argument that we want, which we still know will disappear at runtime. And, and let me say, this is not to prove anything. It's instead you would express arbitrary invariants about your API that are then ex accepted as axioms. And you're using this to build your own properties about your API. You're not using this to prove anything. You maybe use some external tool to produce proofs. And then as a library author, you just have certain, certain preconditions that need to be met um, that, that maybe require proofs of certain things. And the user would, would, as they interact with your API, with the API, they would then sort of learn more information about the data that they were, that they were dealing with. So for example, when um, you, you've, you've, uh, you've like, you may have seen similar things in the justified containers package, which was the, the, the source of inspiration for this um, paper. And, that, and the justified containers package gives you a way to carry around a proof that a key exists in a map, uh, for example, and for, for other containers too. Um, yes, so, so back to, back to ghost, ghostly proofs. So with these, with these uh, proofs that we're now instead in a stick in our uh, phantom type parameter, we can start introducing some combinators. So we could, we, in, 
in the package that is um, published to GitHub, and of course in the paper too, there are many more um, there are many more combinators and there are also eliminators for when you want to um, when you want to maybe you want to forget certain things about the proof that you are, you're dealing with and I, I would encourage you if, if this sounds like it's it, it's something you'd be interested in to check out the github repository because that has the, the latest state of the art uh, and some improvements have been made since the paper uh, around ergonomics um, yes. So how would we? So so we've had we've got these these combinators and these eliminators, and we want to use them to build more complex properties. Um, and and we we what we could what what the paper promises is that we can be actually even begin encoding all rules of natural deduction as functions that produce uh, terms of type proof p. Um, and yeah, you should you should you should look at the paper to to to, to see how that's done. But I'm I'm just gonna I'm just gonna I've just included a fairly simple example here um, that I think will demonstrate some of what is possible um, with this mechanism that the the paper offers. Um, so this is what it this is what it would look like. We could uh, define arbitrary invariance very much like um, what we did before but in this case we're we're, we're uh, defining this rev uh, sort of property and then we can create a proof uh, using using this rev property that says well if I have two lists if I have a list that has been has rev applied to it twice then that is equivalent to the original list um, and of course, we're not doing any, not doing any proving here. Um, so this is this is more just as, as a library author, you would have certain proofs that the users would use when when they're interacting with your your API. Um, and there there are some more examples in the paper, and I have I have some other slides that I'll. I'm here. Yeah. Sorry. So I have some. Um, I have some other uh, deeper examples that we can go into after the sort of the main takeaways of the paper. Um, so, so, so on this in our in our in the reverse function that we might export from our, our library as a library author, we would of course first name the input um, to reverse, and then we would return the 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 rev uh, wrapped. Um, excess, and you'll you'll you, you'll also know that there are no constructors constructors for the for our, for the equals that we've introduced in data p equals equals q. Uh, this is because it's it's of course never existing at the value level. It's only ever existing in the types. Um, yeah, and these the axioms the axioms that we create. We're they're just accepted, and we're we, we're going to rely on more appropriate tooling outside of Haskell to ensure that they hold. Um, another thing to say is that these proofs can also be passed around implicitly with um, a slightly different a slightly different mechanism that that makes that has some sort of context to functions. I think that gets added to as you discover. Um, more about the data structures you're, that you're looking into, um, and yeah, you, there's there's the example that's shown in the paper is is one such where you you actually maybe I'll just show you guys. Sorry, um, actually I'll do that later. Does anyone have any questions on this? Uh, yeah, if we go like back to the, the the basic, like the original sorting example, and we we're saying that we have this phantom type parameter that ensures the comparator will be the same. Like, what what does that what what kind of sameness are we talking about, or what is the mechanism within Haskell that's saying these these match or they don't match? Um, it's 
It's the, it's, it's, uh, sorry, could you repeat the question? I guess when we say um, this has to be the same comparator, yeah. like what exactly does that mean? So we, um, I guess we, this is yeah, kind of a newbie, new to uh, phantom types type of question on my part. Yeah. Um, no, that's a good question. It would it means that we wouldn't be able to pass a different comparison function in. So does does that make sense? Um, I guess what do we mean by same or different? Like, is there, um, you know, we're not like checking these functions for equality in some way because that so, doesn't make, like what what is the comparison so we 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 um we name we we get this special wrapped value and then when we first call sort by we then um we then get back a certain uh, this this other new type that contains what was passed in as a phantom type parameter. So th I think that the core result is that if, if someone, if, if somebody tried to um, merge with a different function passed in, the, you'd get a compile time error. Um, and that phantom, sorry, I've, I've been going too long, but that phantom type parameter is itself a Type? Uh, it's uh, it's a no. It, it's this named value. So that there's 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 a there's a couple of different phantom type parameters. Um, yeah. I wonder is the right way to think about it that the the two things are equal because they have the same name. But the only way two things could have the same names if they actually came from the same site, like the same sort of spot in the code, because they're getting the name, because the name is sort of a phantom, or because it is a phantom. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think the way I understand it is like the names are, when you name things, you introduce the type variable and it's existentially quantified. So if you try to name another thing, you can never enforce that those two different comparators have the same name because they're both under this existential quantification. Um, so that's that's how you sort of enforce that. It's always that same uh, comparator. Well, the only comparator that has that name is the one you uh, introduce the name with. So it's kind of like a fresh name, but at the type level or something. Yeah, it's, it's kind of a way to just conjure names out of thin air at the type level that can't be reused. Yeah, it, it assures they can't be equal to anything else. Neat. My understanding is that's why the name function has a continuation style type signature, right? Is to, since Haskell doesn't have that extensional, can't do extensions in the same way. Is that correct? Yeah, that's, that's my understanding. It, it's just like the, how the ST monad works, it, it uses the same trick. So I think I'll just quickly go through the, the main takeaways. The first one, that as, as um, people on the line very put very well, is that we're using these existential uh, names to discuss values at the type level. Um, with no runtime overhead, we also add um, some combinators and proofs for the users to be able to construct their own safety argument. Uh, and the other takeaway is that, is this useful? And to this, I would say maybe. Um, in, in this case, we're, create, we're ending up creating proof terms that would be first class entities in a dependently typed language, but we're doing it sort of inside of Haskell, which maybe is a sort of a Haskellism. Um, and of course, the library author ha has, the has to also not mess up the proofs um, and then there's also this assumption that the user will go and do these unsafe things, which is generally true, but I, th I think it also doesn't have to always be that way. Um, and then I have some links that may be of interest to people. Uh, there's of course the original paper and 
um, a talk by the author, but a lot of this was, was by Fly. Thank you very much. Great talk. Neat. Any questions, any more questions that hopefully I can answer? Uh, hey guys, just, just to kind of confirm my understanding and uh, why the example I put together in the chat is not possible where some kind of bad function would wrap in the sort by object and say it has a proof, but it's not going to have a proof. Like, how about this case? Sorry? Um, let's say, let's say like, I have a sort by function yep. that provides me a result along with the proof that it's sorted with this comparator. Now, I can create another function that's called bad sort that would provide me the same yes. proof, but it's going to be sorted in a reverse order. What, I don't know. Yeah. What, in, why this, in, in this case, it's, this is this is this is to help the communication between the library author and the user. So yes, the library author could could absolutely come along and implement another sort by function that would return the same uh, the same new type wrapper. But uh -huh. um, but yeah, this is this is this is for the for the library between the library author and the user. And this this is not going to solve the problem that you described. Is like a smart constructor a way to avoid it? Sorry? Would a smart constructor be a solution for that kind of problem? Uh, a mark, mark constructor? No, no. Sm smart. I don't know if I'm familiar with that. Um, okay. Sorry. Smart constructor, you saying? A smart constructor. Yes. I mean, this is. The sort by is sort of a smart constructor. Would, would I, I would probably call it a smart constructor. I think for for constructing the sort by, um, for constructed sorted by lists. Would 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 you would you guys uh, would would you people describe um, sorted by sort by as a smart constructor? Any other any other questions? How did you run across the paper? Oh, um, probably read it, or maybe GitHub. I think maybe I saw someone star on GitHub, and then got led to the paper. Okay, cool. Just curious. Uh, Anthony, not sure if you've been following the chat in Zoom, but uh, there's some chatter in there. Um, I think oh. all the questions have been answered, but uh, in case you want to take a look later. Oh, yes. I see some questions. Yeah, no, have a look. Um, oh, yes. Great question, Stephen. So, yeah, this, this, this is an example of, well, maybe, maybe in our minimum function, we may not, not only require the, the, the list yeah, it's quite quite an obvious thing that the list has um, has elements too. So the paper has some other has some other uh, nice mechanisms, um, and in the same way that we were um, in the, in the same way that uh, in a similar way. Um, we, we can actually introduce these is cons and is nil data types. Uh, and then we can create a head function that requires that the list that passed in is passed into it has an ins, is cons proof attached to it. And now I haven't, I haven't actually introduced the, uh, the three colon, um, the three colon uh, type synonym, but uh, okay. That's, yeah, I'm not, I don't have that covered here. Um, but similarly, you could, after, after doing a pattern match, um, you could then pass the proof that the element, that the list 
contained elements to a, a head function that would require that there was a proof that the list contained elements. Uh, does that does that help answer your question, Stephen? Stefan? Uh, uh, yes, that totally helps. Thank you. I have one more question. Um, yeah, go ahead. Let's say you you were writing code in a full spectrum uh, dependently typed language like Idris or Agda or Talk or yeah. something. Um, and uh, but but you're still like a practical engineer and you don't want to necessarily prove everything uh, the hard way. Um, do you think this technique would still be valuable in such a language? And would you do it the same way, or would is are there any things that you would consider kind of hacky here that you might do differently with real dependent types? Um, I think when I, because in a proper dependently typed language, all of these things are, are, are pretty much first class citizens. Um, so this, this does have a fair amount of sort of syntactical overhead that is non-standard and but the original the original question was asking if there if what I think are the hacky things in this or yeah basically just um, would you do it basically the exact same way in a dependently typed language assuming you didn't actually want right. to write real proofs um, so in a dependently typed language this this would all be a lot easier um, you wouldn't you wouldn't be you, this is sort of a hack to emulate dependent typing sort of in in Haskell. Um, so I think in yeah in a dependently typed language you just use the proper dependent um, primitives. Sure. Thanks. Cool. Uh, actually, I have a question. Um, have you have you used GDP in a like a moderately sized project at all. Uh, I, I've tried a little bit and what I ran into is I just had names all over the place. Like I had something where um, I wanted a predicate that said like this element was within these indices in a sorted list. And so that predicate itself would have like four or five names attached to it. And it just kind of got out of control. And I was just wondering like, do you find any strategies for dealing with like the number of names getting out of control? Um, no, I don't have any strategies for dealing with the number of names coming getting out of control. And I think whilst this is a this is this is like a very interesting set of ideas, um, I I haven't seen it applied successfully in in large scale projects. I just think it's something that shows so, so sort of how versatile and yeah, some, it's sort of a neat trick for that I think for a few simple use cases uh, might be something you'd be interested in adding to your API as a library author. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, cool. Yeah, but thank you. Um, is there any other questions that I might have missed? I think Um, cool. Is there any? I think I've covered the questions that are in the uh, in the, the the chat. Does anyone have any other questions that I can? I, I encourage um, if 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 you're interested in this, the paper presents a lot more examples um, than I've than I've covered here. <laughs>